I will explain a bit of my study background. So I integrated a bachelor's uh, degree in biology at the University of Strasbourg, and I've been exchange student at the University of Montreal in Canada. Uh, then I integrated a master's degree in Strasbourg in uh, physiological ecology and etology. And uh, I joined the research group of Dr. Suvi Ruskanen at the University of Turku for um, conducting my master's thesis. And then I pursued uh, my project by integrating this team as a PhD student. So I will quickly explain uh, the subject of my PhD study just to give a little bit of context. So cells, we are all composed of cells, and cells uh, need to produce energy for living. And for this, they require uh, nutrient and oxygen. And the element in the cell who, which able to produce energy are called mitochondria. And what we observe is that there is a variation in the energy production in cells. Uh, and uh, there is a variation between individuals of the same species, between species, and also within an individual according to um, different life stage. And we expect this variation in energy production in cells to be responsible or to be associated with the difference in growth, aging, and survival of animals. And the purpose of my PhD is to establish the sources of variation of this energy production in cells and to better understand why do we have and what causes this variation. So for this, I study two uh, wild avian bird species, a population of great teeth in Finland and a population of king penguin in Crozer Archipelago in Subantarctic Island. And those two species are really different, but uh, they have different life histories and ecological um, context, environment, different environments. So I can benefit from this difference uh, between species to answer different research questions. So, for instance, we conducted a uh, fieldwork season in Rusalo, close to Turku area, uh, and we monitored the great teat breeding season thanks to nest box installed in the forest. There were several hundred of nest box. And um, the great teat have a really short breeding season. If we take into account the nest building and the hay laying, egg incubation, and chick hatching, then it takes about one and a half months. They have several chicks within the brood and a short lifespan. So, for instance, we can answer uh, or study the impact of the number of nesting and the competition for food in cell energetics. And then the king penguin is really different. He ha it has a really long breeding season. It takes about 40 months for a chick to be fully independent. There is only one chick bird breeding season and they have a really long lifespan. We recorded a uh, king penguin in world that were more than 25 years. Uh, so then, thanks to this species, uh, I can answer or study different research questions, but I will go back on this later during the presentation. So where do we find king penguins? Uh, they live in Subantarctic Island, and we are super lucky because some of the Subantarctic Island are under the French uh, Southern Territories. So quick introduction, there is different point. There is the Ile Epars, close to Madagascar and uh, La Réunion. Uh, on the left, close to Africa. Then there is the Ile Austral, so Subantarctic Island, and it includes Crozet Archipelago, Kerguelen Archipelago, which is a bit more famous, and Amsterdam and Symbol Island. And then there is a piece of uh, land in Antarctica continent, uh, which is called Ter Adeli. So Crozet Archipelago is composed of five volcanic islands. Uh, on this picture, you can see Lille de l'Est, uh, but we are only allowed to go on the position island for conducting research. Um, the full archipelago is about 340 kilometers. The highest point is a bit more than 1,000 meters. And then when we say subantarctic island, we often think that uh, it's super snowy there, but not in Crozet Archipelago. The climate is super windy and rainy. And it's quite warm. The mean air temperature is about five degrees and the mean sea temperature is about <coughs> four degrees. So I will just shortly speak about history. Uh, Crozer Archipelago has been uh, discovered by, uh, an ex under a ex French expedition led by Marc-Joseph Marion Dufresne. And Julien Crozet claimed the French sovereignty of this uh, archipelago on um, 1772. Uh, Crozet Archipelago um, 
was included in the French Southern and Antarctic lands when it has been created in 1955. And the first mission uh, on Possession Island was in 1961. And as you can see on the picture on the left, the first main station was um, in the middle of the King Penguin colony, which is not the case anymore. Uh, after the first uh, mission, then they construct the base Alpha Ford, which is now the current station. And the archipelago joined the natural reserve in 2006 when it has been created. This is a picture of uh, the current station. So how do we reach, reach Crozet Archipelago? Um, it's possible to reach it thanks to the French Polar Institute. And the French Polar Institute used the Marion Dufresne boat for going there. So there is different rotation uh, among the year. And usually the travel uh, is like this. So the boat goes from La Réunion, then it reaches Crozet Archipelago, then Kerguelen Archipelago, Amsterdam and Saint-Paul, and it goes back to La Réunion. Uh, full rotation is about one month. So it means that for going to Crozet, because there is about 2,800 kilometers, it represents approximately five or six days of sailing. And then for coming back, it means that you need approximately three weeks. So you need to take this into account if you like sailing or not. Uh, last year we had the COVID special edition, of course. Uh, so because we will gather in the boat for several weeks and we all came from all over the world, even if it's mostly French people, uh, for instance, me, I came from Finland. So we needed to uh, have a two weeks quarantine in La Réunion, so it was really strict, and we needed to <laughs> we needed to stay in the hotel room uh, during the two weeks. Uh, we had to pass through four PCR tests, and uh, before boarding, we had the body check temperature uh, and some antigenic uh, tests on the boat. So why do we have so many restrictions, or why are we are we so careful? Um, it's because first, yes, we will gather on the boats, but second, the people who have winter last year uh, in those different archipelagos, they didn't have the vaccine yet. So we really needed to be super careful. And even if there is medical equipment on the island, uh, of course, it's less well equipped than uh, in another place in the world. So we really need to be careful about this. So there is four rotations under the French Polar Institute over a year and one specific rotation. Thanks uh, with the Morian Dufresne, but it's not the French Polar Institute. Uh, and the, yeah, those rotations allow us to go for uh, several at different time points. But the summer campaign uh, is from November to April because it's in the South Hemisphere. You need to remember that it's inverted. So in November, most of the species there will start the breeding season. This is why there is a lot of boat uh, trip at this moment. And um, yeah, the Marion Dufresne does not, al do, yeah, does not allow to make people traveling, but it also brings the food there and scientific equipment and building equipment. So it's really important. Uh, usually for summer campaign, uh, people who go there are either a field assistant because we, we need a lot of people. It's like the period where we need to work uh, a lot. It's usually the project, scientific project leader, collaborators, or PhD students uh, like me. And then we have the people who overwinter. So they will spend at least 30 months on the island. They, it, they are usually people who have an experience in field work and uh, they will conduct the whole scientific campaign. And this is because of them that the campaign is successful. So we are super thankful for these people who stay there. And um, so yes, they start in November usually, and then during November and December, they will stay for one month handover and train the new overwintering person. So now I will present you quickly the island so you can follow the red uh, dot on the map and it will show you where I'm talking. Uh, so the red part here is the main station, the base Alfred Fort. And then there is different shelter around the island, and those shelters allow us to conduct uh, scientific research outside of the main station. And for instance, it allows us to reach species that are not so present close to the main station. So this is the Bay American. It's really close to King Penguin, but there is not really a colony established there. We have also Pombas. And 
Point Bas is really far away. Um, you need to think that for going there, there is no car. You need to walk, and it's between five or seven hours walking. And no matter if it's raining or if it's storm, if you go, are there, you are there. So yes, it takes some time to reach that point. But um, for instance, close to this shelter, you have the field of abattoirs. It's called like this, and it's a place where there is many abattoirs breeding. So for instance, people who conduct research uh, on abattoirs often go there. And there is another shelter uh, at this point called La Pérouse. It's super small. I've never been there, but it's super small. Um, this is the king penguin colony close to the main station. Uh, as you can see, there was a lot of penguin. Each dot, black and white here, is a penguin. And uh, yeah, there is a bit more than 20,000 breeders on that colony. So the main station is on the top of the hill. There is a road, no car, but there is a road. The car is for emergency. <laughs> and it's about one kilometer and a half uh, for going there. And uh, there is some shelter in the middle of the colony and those shelters are for the scientific programs. I won't go in detail, but there is several programs working on king penguin. Um, one of them is mostly focusing on diving behavior and physiology. The other one is uh, conducting research on population dynamic and genetic. And another one is working on physiology response according to environmental condition. And I went for this program. Uh, so in the shelter, you have mostly laboratory equipment. And I don't know if you can see, but there is some elephant seal uh, in the middle of the colony uh, on the bottom left. Yes. Uh, this is another picture, just to show you how big it is, the colony. <laughs> Uh, and the dots that are a bit brown, it's cheek. They have a different feather, so they are brownish and not like adult feather. So now if we talk about the king penguin breeding cycle, when we arrive in November, the penguin uh, come on the, in the colony, they will try to find a partner. So for this, they will parade, they will sing because singing is really important for them. It helps us to recognize the partner. And they will try to establish uh, territories. So they do not have nests, uh, properly speaking, but they will try to defend the territories uh, where they will raise, incubate the eggs first and then raise the chick. And as soon as they find and establish the territory, then they are super aggressive, really. Like you cannot pass through the territories without a beak uh, or wing, flipper blow, like, yeah, terrible. Um, and they will try uh, several copulation events. And then if it's successful, uh, the female should lay a egg. So they only have one single head that they will keep on their, on, her, on their feet and keep it warm. The egg is approximately this size, so it's, it's quite big. And usually when the female lays, then she will give the egg to the male. And the male will start the incubation. The female will leave to the sea for foraging and finding food. So at soon as it started, the breeding season is mostly a succession of shift between the parents, between uh, period on land when they are incubating or raising the chick, and period on sea where they will forage for themselves, but also for the chick. So you need to keep in mind that when the penguin is on land, it, it is fasting. So for starting, the shifts are quite long, about two weeks. So it's two weeks fasting and even a bit longer for the male because it has all the parading even before. And then uh, the more we advance in the breeding season and the shorter are the shift. Uh, the incubation time is about 55 days and uh, sometimes the hatching may last several days. So you can see that the egg is broken, but then it takes hours and hours sometimes to see the chick fully away or out of the egg. This is a super fun picture. So it happened that sometimes the partner comes back and the partner on the egg does not want, I'm not sure why, I give the egg straight back. So the partner needs to wait. And yeah, sometimes it, it lasts for one full day and yeah, the other is just waiting. <laughs> this is a chick, I'm not sure if you can see it, but um, the chick are quite small for starting. This is expected. And they are grayish and they don't have really filter. So they are kind of naked like this. <laughs> so 
they are super cute and uh, they yell really strong. Uh, it was inc like, yeah, insane. Uh, but they needed to claim for food, so it's really important for them. But the colony is really noisy. Uh, but I liked it. And then the chick will grow and be bigger, like this. <laughs> and then, yeah, when they are a bit bigger, they are not grayish anymore, but they are burnish and they will have this um, special feather for chick. And yes, uh, so at some point the chick will raise a point where it is uh, fully independent thermically from the parents. So then the parents will still shifting, but they do not need to stay with the chick for protecting it for against the predation, for instance. So at this moment, all the chick were in the colony will kind of gather together and it will be, a, we call it crash in French. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit like kindergarten, they say together against the predation. And then the parents come back sometimes two times to feed it, of course. So this year, our scientific campaign focused mostly uh, on the chick. So because the whole um, breeding cycle takes more than one year, it's about 40, um, 14 months, as I said, for a chick to be independent, then it means that when the penguins start the breeding season, it will overlap on the next breeding season. So then the breeding events are not uh, synchronous anymore. And we can see two peak of reproduction within the breeding season. There is the early breeders leading to early chick and late breeders leading to late chick. So there is two peak of chick event. <laughs> and uh, our campaign this year focused uh, on the differences between the early and the late chicks because it has been observed that the late chicks have um, different survival chances or growth trajectories, so we try to understand better. So for this, we look at the cell energetics, so the production of energy in cell through blood sample, and the laboratory work need to be conducted um, on the, during the field work uh, for this because we need fresh blood and uh, living cell for measuring the energy production. Then we focus on the growth trajectories. For this, we took some morphometric measurements, such as the body mass, the beak length, or the wing length. And we also monitor the survival of the chick um, all over the season. So our main task uh, was to monitor the couple, actually, because you saw it, the colony is really huge, it's more than 20,000 couples. And uh, for this season, for instance, we uh, monitored only 45 couples. So you can find them because they have established the territories, so you have an idea where they should be. But the colony is always kind of moving because the parents are shifting, there is the early penguins, that there is the late penguins, so you kind of know where it is, but still it's moving. So for recognize them, we put some color on the belly with a number and also some color patch on the wing. Of course, we only put uh, the color when they have two, the partner and establish the territory, and then we are kind of sure that it does not affect the partner choosing. And here on the right, this is a chick who starts to molt. So um, molting is like renewing the feather. So this one is having now uh, the hazard feather on the back, but still some brownish chick feather uh, behind the head. So for the chick, we put a small flag in the back to be able to recognize them, but because the feathers are so big, we also need to put plastic ring on the wing. And when the chick is molting like this, then we catch it on the beach and uh, we take the measurement that we need and then we remove the wing, uh, the plastic rings. Uh, what I really liked about this uh, archipelago, of course, is that there is, I love king penguins, but there is not only king penguins. This is a uh, albatross chick. And when the albatross are chick, they are brownish and not fully white. And actually they are whiter when they get older. There is also sea elephants. Those are pups. They are super cute. And um, yes, because the sea elephants are also in the colony, you need to deal with them. So the pups are super cute, but uh, the male are a bit scary, to be honest. And uh, you really need to be careful when you walk through the colony to not disturb a sea elephant seal because it's much bigger than you. So you may get into trouble. Uh, so yeah, it's one funny thing dealing with elephant seals. 
uh, we were super lucky and we saw killer whales several times. So they come close to the beach. Sometimes they take penguins or elephant seal, but uh, it's life. <laughs> and they are really nice. Uh, so we mostly saw two groups and one group was uh, composed of a big male and uh, several killer whale calves. Uh, and we maybe thought that the male was teaching the smallest one to hunt. So, so far I mostly talk about the professional experience, which was great, but also uh, living there for a few months was a huge human experience. So what you need to know is that there is not only scientific people on the, on the main station, but uh, the station is also composed of military people who will make the station uh, function. For instance, uh, the doctor has a military status, the postman as well. And there is also people here uh, coming for the building renovation uh, because it's super windy and rainy all the time, it, next, it needs always re renovation. So it means that we have many people on the same station with a different background and you need to learn how to live together. And because we don't have uh, fully ac access to internet or outside world, uh, of course the relationship you create on the station are stronger and a bit more intense. So those are all the people who were there between November and December through rotation of the boat. And actually we were a lot of people at, at, this, at this time. So we had many social activities and uh, we always take our meals all together. It's a moment where we gather all together when we can share the day and speak about everything. Uh, we celebrated Christmas, New Year's Eve, of course, but also the birthday and there was some tradition on the island always to gather people. Uh, we can watch movies, series, uh, there was a pool game, table football game. Uh, there is, sometimes you can participate to the kitchen activities and on the bottom left, it's the picture uh, in the hospital. So because there is only one doctor in Kose and it's, uh, it's the same for the other island, even if there are several, uh, the doctor always need to train the people on the station uh, in case there is an emergency. So there is some courses about how anesthesia or surgery and it <laughs> makes you remember that uh, if there is an issue you need to be all together and be there for everyone and uh, yeah when we arrived in November the district chief um, told us that Jose was like a big family and even if you don't choose your family you need to stick together and be together and I really like this community mindset. Yeah, another uh, rich experience is when we go outside of the main station. So for people working on camping greens, uh, we go every day in the colony. It's a full-time job. There is not really day off because you need to monitor the penguins, so you need to be there every day. But sometimes to times, uh, if someone can replace you or the workload is not so high, you can go outside of the station in the different shelter I presented to you earlier. So this is the shelter in Pombas, close to the albatross field. And this is usually a moment that you can share uh, with people. It's like a super small community and you play games on the evening and everything. And also traveling there is really intense and, and fun. I really appreciate those experience, even the, if the occasion were quite rare. Uh, this is another trip to uh, La Baie Americaine, the closest shelter to the main station. Uh, of course, we can expect that uh, with such intense uh, landscape and people and, and stories, uh, it's quite difficult to live. So I left the island middle February uh, with four other friends. And um, because at this time the, ro the boat rotation is not uh, by the French Polar Institute, there is no helicopter to drop us on the island. So we needed to use a Zodiac. And uh, for reaching the zodiac, you need to go uh, almost fully underwater. So we had to wear this super safety suit, uh, looking like aliens, uh, but it was super fun. And actually, when we reached the boat, um, we had to climb to the boat, and the boat is uh, several meters high. So they just give you a ladder, and you need to climb. It was super funny. <laughs> uh, so, the second 
most question I had after A, how, what it is, was, hey, what do you do for three weeks on the boat? Of course, you can work, but still there is not internet connection. So one good activity is bird watching because you are traveling underwater when there is so many species in migration. For instance, you can see a uh, wandering albatross flying this time, uh, but also blackboard albatross, many bird species. And one day we were super lucky. We saw so many whales. Uh, so this was in November actually when we go there, but uh, the sea was super calm and they counted more than 100 whales uh, during one day. It was crazy. And then when I left the island, um, because the boat was not, uh, the boat trip was not organized by the French Polar Institute, it was actually an oceanographic campaign. So I met a lot of scientists working on ocean and it was crazy to talk with them and see how passionate they are about the oceans. And they were actually doing a fieldwork season on the boat. So some of them uh, recorded acoustic signal. So um, yes, they, Another team was working on seawater sampling and then check out the composition on the seawater in terms of carbon, for instance. And they managed to collect some seawater at different depths and one depth was um, about 4,000 meters down, which is crazy for me. And then there were a lot of biomass uh, inventory uh, trying to catch fish. And actually uh, we managed to sow the fish that the king penguins eat and it was super nice for us because when we see it, it looks like vomit because uh, it's the parent vomiting for the chick. So it was really nice to see them alive and full, uh, complete, let's say. Uh, but I don't have so much time to talk about this oceanographic campaign, but when we were there, two journalists were present and they are um, explaining the whole campaign on their YouTube channel. So I encourage you to watch it because it's super interesting. And yeah, I think then this is the end. So I really wish to thank uh, all my funding agency, uh, which allows me to conduct my PhD project and live this kind of crazy adventure. I wish to thank my collaborators, the programs on Disney for who I went, my supervisor, and also all the people who helped me on the field or during this PhD project. And I also wish to thank my uh, collaborating institution, the University of Strasbourg and to thank the Institut Français de Finlande, of course, for inviting me for this talk. Thank you for your attention. And I may also have a video about King Penguins. <laughs>